This week on the podcast, Labor's National Conference, Child Labor on the Rise in the US, and my first-hand experience with students resisting fascism in India. This podcast was recorded on stolen land. Green Left is committed to supporting struggles for First Nations justice. Welcome to the latest episode of the Green Left News Podcast. My name is Isaac Nellis, and today we'll be talking about the news in Australia and around the world. Uh, Starting off with our feature story this week, which is Labor's National Conference, which took place from August 17th to 19th. And while there were some internal disagreement around some policies, the debate seemed more like political theatre, according to those who attended, including Michael West Media and others. The conversation described it as carefully orchestrated, and there was little substantial change from Labor's previous positions. The $368 billion AUKUS nuclear submarine deal was supported, despite rank-and-file disagreements and an anti-nuclear amendment that was moved by the Electrical Trades Union National Secretary, Michael Wright. Overall, it was a fairly predictable and pathetic showing from Labor, who continue to rule for the warmongers and the mega-rich. What was more interesting was the multiple days of protests that were held outside the conference, by climate, anti-war, housing and Palestine activists. It's important that these campaigners aren't letting Labor get away with its destructive anti-people policies and these protests are showing the growing grassroots anger with the Albanese government. And there's some great photos uh, of these protests on the Green Left Facebook page, so uh, check that out. So let's talk housing, starting with the sad news that Margaret Kelly, who's the final tenant at the Barrack Beacon public housing estate in Port Melbourne, has been evicted from her home of more than 20 years. We've been reporting on this campaign on the podcast for months as Margaret and a team of housing activists try to resist the seizure of public land and the destruction of public homes. Now, homes Victoria began demolishing parts of the estate before Margaret had even left, and she's a 68-year-old disability support pensioner and former teacher and was forcibly removed by Victoria police officers. There's been protest vigils held outside the estate for the past month and a half. Um, Back in July, Margaret spoke at Green Left's housing forum, and you can actually read her full speech at uh, greenleft.org.au. Other speakers at the forum included Gabrielle DeVitri, who's the Greens MP for Richmond, and the Greens spokesperson for renters' rights, and also Sue Bolton, who's a Socialist Alliance councillor for Mary Beck. Another housing estate that's set for demolition is the Techno Park estate in Williamstown. Techno Park is a former migrant housing site that now houses roughly 100 people. The council handed out mass eviction notices in May, ostensibly because the land is zoned as industrial and not residential, even though the site has been used as housing since the 1950s. Residents have started a campaign to save Techno Park, and you can find more information at their Facebook page. An important event Uh, that's coming up uh, regarding housing is uh, the Housing Justice Summit, which uh, housing activists are coming together from across the country on October 8 at 1 p.m. Eastern Time uh, to hear from housing researchers and unionists, followed by a discussion led by housing tenants who are fighting to protect their homes. So that'll be a really great event. So that's October 8. The summit is being held at the offices of the Maritime Union of Australia in Gaddy, Sydney, but will also be available on Zoom. And it'll be an important event to bring together all these staunch activists from across the country to work out how to resist the privatisation of public housing, fight for renters' rights and fight for homes for people instead of for profit. The climate movement continues to fight coal and gas projects across the country. In Gaddy, a protest was held on August 10th against the Santos gas project in the Pilliga on Gomoroi land, and rallies were held in cities across the country calling for native forests to be protected from logging. In the Northern Territory, a no new gas coalition has been formed to stop fracking in the Beedaloo Basin, and the coalition includes a number of climate and environment groups, including Frack Free NT, Australian Parents for Climate Action, and the Environment Centre NT. It says the threat of imminent fracking, as well as the proposed expansion of offshore gas and onshore processing, 
needs a united community response. Meanwhile, an unreleased New South Wales Department of Fisheries report has given a grave warning about the condition of the Darling Baka River, with the potential for more mass fish deaths as the weather warms. The demise of the Murray-Darling Basin is a threat to the whole country, as water scarcity not only affects drinking water, but also agriculture and industry, and consequently, food supply. Environment Minister Tanya Plibersek must ensure that action is taken to restore a sustainable water system in the Murray-Darling Basin. And one of the big actions that is coming up uh, around climate, and we're trying to encourage everyone to attend, uh, is the People's Blockade of the world's biggest coal port in Newcastle. So Blockade is being organised by Rising Tide from November 24 to 27. And they're aiming to draw at least 3,000 people to blockade the port, following on from the successful blocking of a coal train in April. So Green Left will be joining the blockade and providing first-hand coverage, and we'd love to see you there. Uh, there's actually a bunch of uh, events coming up, a speaking tour to build up to the uh, People's Blockade, and I'll give more details at the end of the episode. In the midst of the Voice campaign, Western Australian Labor announced on August 8 it is repealing the Aboriginal cultural heritage laws after sustained opposition from vested mining, pastoral and farming interests. The laws have only been in place for five weeks and were enacted after Rio Tinto legally destroyed the Jukan Gorge Caves in 2020, after being warned by traditional owners that they were a significant cultural site. This continues the trend of Labor governments siding with mining companies and others against First Nations people fighting to protect their land, water and culture from destruction. In Victoria, a sacred Jabwarung birthing tree was vandalised on August 10 with the words build this road sprayed onto the tree as well as drilling into the trunk. Jabwarung woman and independent Senator Lydia Thorpe said on August 15 that the Daniel Andrews government had removed surveillance systems and protective fencing and she called on Federal Environment and Heritage Minister Tanya Plibersek to ensure that the maternity trees are kept safe. Meanwhile, in Sydney, uh, on Gadigal land, a Black Lives Matter protest was held on August 19, calling attention to the more than 500 First Nations deaths in custody since the 1991 Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody handed down its recommendations. Of the 339 recommendations that were made, only one has been implemented, which is the implementation of real-time reporting of deaths, though nothing has been done to actually prevent the deaths, and no police officers or prison staff have been charged for any of these killings. The rally drew a few hundred people and speakers promised to keep fighting for justice. Something that's relevant to all of these stories I've just been talking about is the United Nations Human Rights Committee finding on July 10 that Australia is violating the land rights of First Nations people in favour of mining interests. The Wuna Niapali people of Western Australia's Eastern Pilbara region filed a complaint in 2019 with the UNHRC after their native title claim conflicted with another claim that was negotiating with mining companies. They found that they were being denied their ability to speak for that territory, and human rights lawyer Scott Calnan said the UNHRC decision breaks new ground and is an important uh, opportunity for a step forward in First Nations land rights. Protests were held across the country against AUKUS and nuclear submarines on August 6, marking Hiroshima Day, the anniversary of the dropping of uh, nuclear bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. The rallies also called on Labor to sign the 2017 Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Speakers drew links between US imperialism and rising militarism, as well as the government and establishment media's attempts to drum up war against China. Rallies stressed the importance of building a peaceful and nuclear-free Pacific and called on Australia to develop its own foreign policy independent of the US warmongers. A few days later, the National Union of Students organised welfare, not warfare rallies, calling on the government to spend money on housing, welfare, education and health care, not war machines and weapons. Meanwhile, the Albanese government has refused to adopt war powers reforms that would give MPs the opportunity to vote on whether Australia goes to war. 
Labor and the coalition voted together to maintain the current captain's call system, whereby the decision is left up to the Prime Minister. Dr Alison Bronowski from Australians for War Powers Reform said the decision is disappointing and reveals a disturbing anti-democratic mindset in the government. If the government wants to send our sons and daughters to another foreign war, she said, it needs to have the Australian public support through their local representatives. And now we're going to talk about the community campaign uh, where more than 1,000 people, accompanied by their dogs, babies and grandmothers, joined hands around Preston Market on August 12 to send a message to the Victorian government to protect the Preston Market from developers. Real estate group Salter Properties and developer Medic Corporation wants to demolish 80% of the markets for a car park and shopping mall. And activists say Labor must support the community and acquire the land to ensure the future of the markets. And now we'll hear what's happening around the world. A military coup against Nigeria's president, Mohamed Bazoum, on July 26 was inspired by anti-French sentiment in the country. Bazoum was considered a French pawn. France has military bases and leeches uranium power from the country, and this follows similar anti-French coups in Burkina Faso and Mali. Socialist Labour, a group from the neighbouring country Nigeria, warned, however, that Nigeria needs a mass movement against poverty, not a coup, and that fighting between political elites and the military will not help the situation. Military intervention from the economic community of West African states to restore Bazoom is possible. And we'll be following this story very closely at greenleft.org.au, so uh, check it out for updates. Meanwhile, YouTube personality Jordan Shanks, also known as Friendly Geordies, has released a 45-minute documentary about Indonesia's military occupation of West Papua and its 2021 bombing of Kiwirok, and surrounding remote mountain villages. The video, which has almost 1 million views, maybe passing that by now, has given attention to the West uh, Papuan independence struggle, which is very significant. Meanwhile, in Malaysia, the elections for six states took place on August 12th, with both Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim's unity government and the Perikatan National Opposition each retaining three states. The Socialist Party of Malaysia, or PSM, also contested the elections, aligning with the youth-based Malaysian United Democratic Alliance, or MUDA, which means young, in a bid to counter the growing race and religion-based politics in the country. Unfortunately, the PSM and MUDA did not receive enough votes to win any seats, but PSM General Secretary Bawani KS told Green Left that public support for a third force in Malaysian politics is there. Bawani explained that Ibrahim's unity government, which is an alliance of the centre-left Pakatan Harapan Party, and the right-wing Barisian National, does not offer much of an option for voters. Bawani also told Green Left about the PSM's campaign for an age pension, affordable housing and free education. And you can watch the full interview with Bawani on the Green Left uh, YouTube channel and website. Meanwhile, Algeria is being seriously affected by climate change, yet authorities have agreed to a dangerous new lead and zinc mine, which is actually a joint venture with a South Australian-based miner, uh, Terramin. Algeria is one of 24 hotspots that are highly vulnerable to climate change, according to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And this is the context in which a university lecturer, Kamel Aysat, is fighting to protect Algeria's environment and challenging the zinc mining project that locals say will contaminate groundwater and displace communities. Aysat was banned from leaving the country on July 15 and has been placed under judicial supervision and threatened with arrest. His supporters are proud of his involvement in mobilising the local population against this dangerous project, and a campaign in solidarity with ISAT is calling for the legal proceedings against him to be dropped and for an end to repression and intimidation. Meanwhile, a story that has been developing seemingly every time we record this podcast has been the strike action taken by the Canadian dock workers, uh, who are the members of the International Longshore and Warehouse Union um, now they have voted to accept a new tentative agreement with employers represented by the BC Maritime Employers Association. So this ends a strike that was started in early July 
and along the way, workers withstood sustained efforts by maritime employers, industries in the United States and Canada, and politicians at various levels of government to push for strike-breaking legislation. Full details of the deal have not been released, but it's been reported that it includes wage rises, benefits, and training. The Greater Vancouver Board of Trade president estimated that $10.7 billion of trade was disrupted during the strike, and that just shows the true power that workers in logistics and transport industries can wield. Meanwhile, the tragic death of a 16-year-old working at a sawmill in Wisconsin in the US has revealed that child labour and exploitation is on the rise in the country. Michael Schulz died after getting pinned in a wood stacking machine while trying to unjam it. And such deaths on the job are becoming more and more common as states aim to allow super exploitable child labour, especially in industries with little union presence. According to the Economic Policy Institute, there's been a coordinated multi-industry push to expand employer access to low-wage labour and weaken state child labour laws in ways that contradict federal protections. Child labour is particularly prevalent in the agricultural sector and there are hopes that this tragedy will draw attention to the issue of child exploitation and encourage unions and other organisations to rally the public to end child labour and exploitation. I'm sure many of you have seen uh, footage of the deadly fires in the Hawaiian island of Maui that have killed more than 100 people as of August 17. Images of the historic city of Lahaina burning to the ground as people try and escape into the ocean have been seen around the world. And Maui native and national director of the Green New Deal Network, Kaniela Ng, told Democracy Now! that climate change is one of the causes of the fires, the other being land mismanagement. So water has been diverted away from land for use on golf courses, hotels, and monocropping. And people now, after these fires, are desperate for food, drinking water, shelter, and other necessities. But governments have been very slow to provide aid. Now, the residents of Maui also face the threat of disaster capitalism as private companies seek to profit from the tragedy. While Biden refuses to allocate money to deal with the climate emergency, we must stand with Hawaiians facing the most deadly wildfire in US history. Now I'm going to talk about a recent trip that I went on with a fellow host, Chloe, and uh, our other friend, Jacob. We attended the All India Student Association's uh, National Conference in early August. So we got a really great experience being shown around the city of Kolkata by members of ISA, which is the student organization of the Communist Party of India, uh, Marxist-Leninist. While we were there, we had a lot of great discussions with all the students, and uh, it's unfortunate that Chloe couldn't be here on this episode to discuss it with me, but it was a great experience. Uh, We attended the memorial for Saraj Dutta, who was a CPIML leader in West Bengal who was killed by the state uh, in the 70s. He's one of thousands of martyrs from the CPIML who were killed during the 1970s under severe state repression. Another issue that sprung up while we were actually... uh, in Kolkata. We were staying at Jadavpur University, uh, which is one of the best universities in the state and is uh, regarded for having very uh, left-wing politics, a very active student body. But there was a tragic suicide of an 18-year-old student in his first week due to kind of severe hazing rituals, which are known as ragging. So the students initiated this massive campaign to end ragging on not only Jadavpur University's campus, but campuses across India. And they've organized protests, an indefinite sit-in, they're meeting with authorities and trying to ensure that uh, something like this doesn't happen again. So that was quite obviously tragic, but quite inspiring to see how the students uh, reacted. You can read more about the uh, ragging campaign at greenleft.org.au. So overall, it was an incredible experience and we've got great contacts with Um, some of the students from ISA and the CPIML Liberation. So uh, check out the coverage on greenleft.org.au. You can read more about all of these stories, plus videos, detailed analysis, and book and music reviews at greenleft.org.au.
So as I mentioned earlier in the podcast, Rising Tide is organizing a blockade of the world's biggest coal port in Newcastle in November. But before that, they've organized a speaking tour of various cities to discuss the need for urgent climate action and provide more information about the people's blockade. Some of these sessions have already taken place, but there are sessions coming up in Karayurta or Adelaide on August 28, Nam or Melbourne on August 30, in Gunnawal or Canberra on September 3rd, and Gaddy or Sydney on September 4th, and finally in Mullumbimba, Newcastle on October 9. And if you've enjoyed this podcast, then Green Left would love your support. You can become a supporter today for only $5 a month, cheaper than a cup of coffee or a beer, and you can donate to our 2023 Fighting Fund to help us continue reporting on workers, climate and social justice movements. So go to greenleft.org.au slash support to help us out. Your support is really appreciated. And remember to follow Green Left on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Threads and TikTok for the latest news and analysis. Thanks for listening.